Hi, and welcome to this introductory video on the Multi-Agent Transport Simulation Toolkit, or just MATSIM for short. In this first of a three-part video, we provide our philosophy of modeling. Why do we need models? If you're interested in any of the other videos in this MATSIM training series, just click on the YouTube logo now. All videos are part of the training series that we hosted for the Gauteng Department of Roads and Transport as they prepare to set up the Gauteng Integrated Transport Modeling Center. Towards the end of this three-part introduction, I'll recommend the sequence that I think you should work through these training videos. Matsum is a free and open source project hosted on SourceForge. Matsum provides a framework to implement large-scale agent-based transport simulations. And simulation is a valuable tool when planning. But why do we need planning? Alan Lakin said it so elegantly. To bring the future into the present so that you can do something about it now. What do we mean when we talk about transport planning? Let's consider a few examples, and these are just from a South African context. In the past few years, we've experienced the introduction of the Gauteng, Africa's first rapid rail link right here in Gauteng. What if we want to see how the ridership will change if we add more lines to the Gauteng network? That is planning. Or how many people more will use the Gauteng if the feeder bus routes are changed or expanded? And bus rapid transit has received a lot of attention recently too. How will congestion change if certain portions of the road are reserved exclusively for the BRT buses, like it happened in the Johannesburg CBD area? Or amidst the controversy surrounding the e-toll as part of the Gauteng Freeway Improvement Project, how can we estimate how many people will divert away from the freeway once toll is implemented? Also, who are these diverters? Are they the rich, the poor? And also, where will they divert to? These are all planning type questions that decision and policy makers are confronted with. And as in the majority of these examples, they are expensive projects. So you don't just build a hard train and see if people will use it. And that's where models come in. A model is a replica of the real world that we can use to test a number of what-if scenarios. What if toll is set to X? What will happen? And to Y? Make no mistake. A model is never exactly the same as reality. It never is reality. But it should be a good representation of reality. It should be scientifically sound, yet make intuitive sense. I really like this model and I've adapted it from John Casti, who's really into the theory of models. Anyway, there are two domains or two worlds. The reality, the real world, and the model world. And coming from the real world, you should already have a scenario in mind when you consider building a model or a metric. You must know how you're going to measure the scenario. If you don't, no model will really help you make a better decision. On the other hand, in the model world, different models have different specifications. Some models are good at some things, but horrible at others. To use the analogy of building a house. A 3D mock-up of your house is an excellent model if you want to evaluate the aesthetics and how well the form, the look and feel will fit in with the environment and surroundings. The 3D mock-up, however, is a crappy model to use for a structural engineer to test the strength of the roof structure. And then there's an iterative back and forth to encode the real world into the model world, translating the real world using the certain syntax provided by the model specification. And yes, there's a lot of data gathering and cleaning and analysis to really try and understand the real world so that you tra your translation is a good one. And once we've run and solved the model, it just provides us with a solution. We then need to decode that solution back into human understandable terms and evaluate it until we can formulate a decision. And this is actually for me a major issue but maybe a more philosophical one and that is that we never solve the real world problems we only solve the model it is the decision based on the model that gets implemented in the real world and hopefully that decision is a good one and it gets implemented well so that it actually changes the real world's problem for the better but we solve mere models not reality George Box famously said, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Still, we need models 
because it is simply too expensive and sometimes even destructive to play around with transport infrastructure without testing the scenarios in decent models. But here's the fascinating bit. Well, it's actually somewhat mind-boggling that many people don't get it. Your scenario metric of your choice of modeling tool influences your possible solutions quite significantly. When we need to start framing our problems, our real worlds differently. Here's an example. If we frame the problem as merely congestion, we're pretty limited to our possible solutions. For one, and most spectacularly, we can simply build more roads. Yet if we frame our problem more distinctly and we rather have a metric something like mobility, then we open an entirely new array of solutions and model specifications that include different land users, non-motorized transport, public transport, and many more. But let's stop here. That is a philosophical debate we can have in an entire video series of its own. So why are we concerned with transport planning? A few years ago we realized that the state of practice models that are used to support transport decisions are firstly not very good representations of the South African reality and secondly they are not very intuitive to understand and validate. The state of practice models are referred to equilibrium assignment models and they indeed are quite sophisticated models. They are often referred to as four step models because in the first step called trip reduction and attraction the study area is divided into zones that are similar in their traffic characteristics. For each zone, we calculate the number of trips produced and the number attracted. For example, a residential area will produce many more work trips and education trips in the morning as people leave their homes, drop the kids off at school and go to work. A business area with many office buildings, on the other hand, is mainly a trip attractor. In the second step, each trip produced in one zone is matched to a trip attractor in another zone. And the matching usually follows some gravity model. That is, you are more likely to go to work to a place close to you than to a place much further away. And the result of this step is what is known as an origin destination matrix. In the third step, each origin destination pair or OD pair is assigned an estimated modal split based on the available services. So if it is a high income area with limited or no public transport services, the majority of trips are assumed to be by private car. Lastly, the route for each trip is assigned to the underlying network, taking the network capacity into account. And this is indeed a fairly sophisticated assignment model using volume delay functions and the like. The network loading finds an equilibrium assignment until all the links are evenly loaded. Well, I argue that you can just look out the window. Traffic is never in equilibrium. It's just the level of inequilibriumness, if such a word exists, that moves around. And my background is in mathematical programming and optimization, a branch within operations research that deals with these type of problems. Minimizing some objective function, subject to some constraints, using all but quite confusing notation. And not even I solved such a problem this morning when I decided how I was going to work and by what route. It simply is not intuitive. It does not reflect the way in which real people make decisions. Yet, these models are used to influence and support decisions that will impact us in the real world. So we decided by doing something. But why? Why research? And to build on Alan Lakin's definition of planning. I believe our mandate as researchers are to find solutions to problems today that industry and government will need in five years time from now because it will probably take us five years to find decent solutions. And that brings us to the end of this part of the introduction. You can just click on the YouTube icon to go to the playlist containing all of the training videos. Alternatively, you can click on one of these figurines. The little man will take you to the second part of this vid video series when we talk about why we chose Matsum as a viable alternative. Or you can click on the little woman for part three, where we give an overview of Matsum itself. Thank you for joining.